In this particular video, we're going to have a look at the gauge architecture that's associated with the course. For the particular, uh, the architecture basically tied together all of the different demos that we had a look at into a single coherent whole. So in this sense, it's something that combines a game loop. It has alongside that the ability to load in and to store different types of asset. It has a, a surface that we can draw bitmaps and other things to. Um, it has audio that we can end up playing. You know, all of the, the foundational bits that we need to have combined together if we want to create a game. So this is going to offer this. It'll drive. It'll produce a few more drive types as well in terms of having a generic notion like a game screen in the game object that we can then refine into something that is specific uh, to your game. But very much, it is this architecture that takes together each of the individual demos, links them together into something that gives you a platform, a basis, foundation if you like, on top of which you can then start introducing and building up your different game objects. Um, so we'll, we'll go through, there's a fair amount to cover within this and it does, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you're sort of happy with all of the individual pieces, so this is very much looking at how they can combine um, together. In terms of the, the Gage um, project, it, uh, you know, it downloaded, fits into a number of things. Um, you have the Gage folder with most of the, the different elements uh, within it, and then there's a few sort of example games which sort of illustrate how you can take the Gage framework and then build upon them to provide a, a remarkably simple notion of a platform or a, or a space-based game. Uh, just by way of, I suppose, of running these. Uh, so whenever it runs, we um, we're going to have a, a game screen representing our main menu. Uh, this is our, our, our basically our menu screen, uh, this particular one here. So it'll appear and it'll, it'll give us a couple of options as to which type of demo we want to do. And if we click on the, the platform one, we, we get a ball, we get a randomized set of platforms to just randomly create it. I can move this about, uh, the ball can jump and, and move about the environment. But that, that was our, our sort of our, our simple, if you like, um, platform game uh, when we're having a look at that. And the second one was the space, space demo where we have a controlled player controlled ship there's some AI entities either will look towards the player or try to track the player uh, around the level as they as they move. Um, but a couple of illustrations of things that, that build upon um, the basic uh, framework. So we want to have a look at uh, what underpins that and what makes those different aspects uh, possible. So our starting point is going to be the main activity class. Uh, so this is the one that extends activity. It's our initial starting point. And the gauge architecture is set up to have a single activity involving a single fragment, uh, which contains a single view. And that view then is the screen that we draw to. So within the activity, and I actually have a, I'll go back to this here, I have a, a picture which will illustrate the, this particular setup. So we have our main activity. It's the activity in which the game runs. It contains a fragment. Now we're going to call the fragment game. And the reason we call it game is that the fragment is going to contain all of the key subsystems, if you like, that we will need to make a game possible. So those subsystems includes the game loop. So this will be the thing that we can configure to give us an update and a draw tick at a regular interval. Um, alongside that, it'll also contain a file IO manager that if we need to load things in, we can use that. It'll contain an asset store. So the things that we do load in that we want to share and to make available across our different game objects, we'll put them in the asset store and it'll be up to the asset store to, to manage that sharing process. It'll contain our input manager. So when we're looking to get input, uh, either from touch events or from the accelerometer, then we'll go to our input manager. Uh, it'll have a screen manager. So if we have different screens within our game, for example, our menu screen or level one or option screen, things like that, they notionally will live within the screen manager. And we have our renderable surface. I'm going to use an interface here and have a particular type. But that is the, the view, the surface that we can draw our game to. Uh, the other one here is, is the elapsed times. This is something that the game loop produces and gives us a bit of information on how much time has elapsed since the last time we were updated or, or drawn. 
Uh, but at a high level, then, that, that gives us our, our fundamental starting assumption. And, and it is an assumption. This, this assumes single activity linked to a single fragment that contains a single view. And then we have lots of other um, managers at that particular level. So the game objects that we can put in any time they need to, to draw something, to load something in, to get input, basically they just need access to the game, which is our fragment. And then all of those services are offered uh, to them at that particular level. So we go back to our code. We'll have a look at main activity, have a look at game. Uh, main activity is our activity, so we have the onCreate method where we're just doing a bit of configuration for the, the window and then adding in um, the, the frame. Uh, and on back press, we update that so we, we capture if the back key is pressed. Game class then, this is the one that is the, the heart of the game and it's probably the largest uh, single class that we have within this. So it is a type of fragment. And it's the one class where you have lots of different bits inside it because this is the one that ties everything together. So if you're scrolling down through that, you'll see some things about relating to the number of frames and updates per second that our game loop uses. Um, you'll, you'll see down there that we have our asset manager for storing the things we load in. We have our screen manager for storing the different game screens that are relevant to that game. We have our input manager, so for getting input for, from the device. And we have our, our file I.O. to sort of help um, if anything else needs to be loaded in, a map description or something like that. And then finally, we have our, our renderable surface, the things we, the thing we will be drawing to when we want to, to draw our game objects. So that's, that's our main components. Um, we have one other one for the game loop, um, but we're not necessarily sort of sharing that with other game objects. It will rather control when updates and draws happens. Uh, the rest of them are, are shareable because they all have sort of getter methods where a game object can ask to get the input because it wants to make use of it. A um, few things there about the screen, oh, the screen width and the, the screen height, um, just to store what it is for the uh, particular fragment. Then we have onCreate, and because it's a fragment, we'll have onCreate view just under it. The onCreate, uh, at this point we create our loop, we create our file I.O., we create our asset store, we create our, our screen manager, and we do a little bit of configuration that we want to uh, respect any volume control requests that we want to use that to change our volume. So all of these things we can create uh, whenever the fragment is created. For the onCreate view, which is the next one, so we only, this one gets called obviously whenever the view is being created. At that point, we're going to create our new render surface. Now, if you remember above, the render surface was a type of interface. So here we're saying that the particular type of render surface we're creating is a canvas render surface. And we'll look at the rendering bit in a little second. And <clears throat> we're getting that as a view. And that view is the thing then is returned down at the, the bottom of the, the method. Um, once we've created the view, we also then create our input manager. Because we're getting touch events from that view, we need to create it at the same time as the view actually gets to be created itself. And we extract it a little bit by way of the display metrics, uh, so we know how big uh, the view is uh, in terms of our screen. Uh, underneath this, we have resume, we have pause, where we're starting and stopping um, the, the loop, and also letting the screen manager know that they've been started or stopped for the current screen. Uh, destroy and on back uh, pressed. Uh, for the update method in the draw, so, so these are ones that our game loop is going to, to trigger. So if we call the update, uh, what we're going to do within this here is um, we'll have a look at our input manager in a second, but there we will want to, to basically capture all input that has occurred since the last uh, time update was called and we're passing that accumulated input in as the input that's available for the current frame. So we do that through a, a set of accumulators. Uh, we then go to our screen manager, and if we do have a, a current screen that's been added, we update that screen. So if the main menu is currently active, we're updating the main menu. If we're currently on the game screen, we're updating uh, the game. And uh, this, this is set up to have a degree of, 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 of sort of multi-threading support. So whenever we finish doing that, then we notify um, the game loop that we've completed our update. And this, this will go to the loop and it's going to tell it that the update has been done. Likewise, we have a similar thing for the, the draw. So anytime we're asked to do the draw, uh, we're going to go to our game screen, get the current screen, 
And if we have one, we're going to go to our render surface. This is the, the view object. And we're going to grand, render to that the game screen. And we're passing in here some timing information in case that's important for any element of, of how we draw the thing out. And um, it is the responsibility of the render surface to, to notify the game loop, in other words, to call the notify draw completed method whenever it has finished rendering the game screen. So in this sense here is up to the, the render surface to, to do that notification. Final thing we have done at the bottom then is actually our game loop itself. So if you expand this class, it's just, just the standard game loop we had um, explored within one of the demos. Um, and a little bit of, of sort of synchronization so that we uh, can do this in a thread safe manner if we have multiple threads. But again, you can have a look at how, how that works. So that's, um, in essence, that's, that's, all we, that's all we have within our, our game. It contains all of these different um, elements all linked together with the game loop then um, ticking away. So we'll, we'll go now and we'll, we'll break down into each of these to sort of see them in turn. Um, we'll start off first of all with our uh, asset store. Uh, so this particular one here, if I move it down so we can see the whole thing on the screen. So we're going to have um, an asset store which will contain all of the things that we've loaded in. It's going to make use of a file IO manager to help us load it in. And we're going to have, um, currently at the minute, in terms of this simple architecture, three types of asset. We can have a music track that we stream, uh, a sound uh, clip that we can play, and a bitmap that we can display. So we go back to our code and have a look at this one here. Uh, so for these particular ones then, inside our engine folder, we've got sort of all of the main classes. We've got our asset store within this. So if we open up our asset store and have a look at what we have within this. In essence, it's simply a collection of, of maps, of hash maps in this case, where we have uh, a name, associate it with a bitmap and then we have basically a hash map of those so if i have a background bitmap i can load it in i can say that it's called my background is the particular string name that i give to it and if i need to make use of that i can go to my asset manager and i can say that i want you to give me a bitmap whose name is background pass in the string and it'll give me out the copy that it retains so it's, the asset store is the, the thing that retains all of these different elements. So we've got hash maps for bitmaps, uh, for music objects, for sound objects, and we've got our file editor which is using to help load the thing in. When we create the asset store, we're simply creating all of these different components. Um, we can then add in assets, be it a bitmap or a music one or a sound asset. And there's a little bit of check just to see, okay, do we have a named element within it? Um, we've got load and add bitmap. So this one sort of will load it in using the file IO and then store it and, and so on. So they're all methods of how being able to add things into the asset store. Three ones at the bottom are the ones that our game objects are going to use. So if I've got a player, and the player wants to get access to, let's say, the run animation, uh, because that's what it wants to use, then I'll go to Asset Store, it'll call the Get Bitmap, and it'll pass in the name of the bitmap that we've given to it that we want to get out. And the Asset Store will then go and try to retrieve that, or, or give a null value if it, if it can't find the thing. Um, so all, all of those are sort of the key bits within this. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the different elements for for example, audio, you can have a look at the music, at the sound things. These again are just similar to the ones that we had in the, the demo for, for streaming music or for displaying it. Uh, bitmap is the built-in Android bitmap, so there's not really any change uh, to, to that one. So that's our asset store. We go down a bit more to our screen manager, which was the other uh, main element we had coming off our main game fragment. So there, our screen manager, it contains one or more screens. So, you know, it's going to be things like our main menu or, or level one or level two, the different large screens that we might have within the game that we can go to and we can notionally update and draw the screen. Um, game screen can have an optional set of viewports. So in terms of if, if our game notionally is bigger than, than, than what we want to display on the screen, we can have a layer viewport which determines the, the bit of the game 
that we get to see at any point in time and the screen viewport which determines the region of the screen to which we will we will display whenever we are drawing that particular screen out uh, so so both of those are there if there is a need to introduce a viewport in if not it just assumes that all of the layer uh, the game screen is visible and is visible in all of the screen so that that makes sense for menus and things like that um, the game screen itself uh, now it, it well it probably will contain a number of game objects depending on what type of screen that it is uh, so these game objects could be the player, could be the character, could be collectible. Arguably, you could have things like buttons if you want to call them a type of game object as well. But a game screen contains a bunch of things uh, that can be updated, that can be drawn. And we're calling the game objects here. Uh, we'll have a look at this one. This, this notionally is a, a simple object that can be displayed within a game. And we've got one derived type, which is a sprite, which is a type of moving object. Uh, so we'll have a look at these things now uh, within our code. So if we are off to this one here, we've got our screen manager class. Uh, so the screen manager, it um, contains a, a map of screens. So I could uh, add in a number of different screens and give them a name. So I could, I could go to my screen manager and I could say, give me the main menu screen. And that's a particular key that I've been passing in for doing that. We also have a current game screen. So this is the one that if we go to your screen manager and say, okay, update yourself, draw yourself, it'll update or draw the current screen. That's what we assume. This particular implementation is a simple one. It assumes that you only have one sort of screen active at a time. Um, in some of your games, if you have multiple layers, you might have a background layer, a background screen, a game screen, a HUD screen. So you, you might want to extend this so that you can have more than one active at a point in time. Uh, how does it work? Well, there's a bit here for adding a screen in, just simply checks to see if we have that existing screen. If not, we add it in. A um, bit about setting something as the current screen, a bit about getting the current screen, or getting out a screen by name, or removing a screen, or disposing. Uh, whenever we've got rid of this thing, we go through and we dispose each of the screens. So we give a chance for any, any sort of shutdown operations to be done. So a very simple class, doesn't actually do um, particularly much uh, within it. So in terms of the, the screen manager, I've opened up our world folder. Inside this we can see, um, well, we can see the, the game screen, which is the thing that the screen manager contains uh, one or more of. So this is an abstract class. So it's intended to be overloaded with some specific type of game screen. And it's a very simple class, not much to it. Uh, we give a, a game screen a name, uh, main menu, level one, wherever you want to be. Uh, we link it in to the game. So a game screen has a direct link to the game fragment. And the reason we do that then is the game screen has access to the input manager, the asset manager, the asset store. All of those things are now accessible and available to it. So that's how we get access to these things. And we can get the game out. That means that if we have a game object that's part of this game screen, it can go to its game screen and go to the game screen and say, OK, can you give me um, the game that I'm part of? And then the game object itself can get access to all of those different managers. So if we want to check for input, we can get it. Uh, construct it doesn't do much. Two abstract methods. These are the key ones, update and draw. So whenever update is called, then we will we're passed in time information about how much time has elapsed since the last time update was called and so on. Uh, we can update our game in, in some screen specific way and draw we're asked then to update our, our game or sorry draw our game again using the timing information and we're also given a graphics object and we'll look at that in a second that we can use to draw out ourselves if we want to draw bitmaps we'll do it through that particular object and anything we draw through that will automatically be drawing on the view surface that's how the graphics one will be set up Pause, resume, and dispose, if you want to uh, tap into those uh, different lifecycle events. Um, so the other ones we had uh, within this here, a screen manager contains a game screen. The two viewports are just fairly similar to the demo that we had. They, they define a width and a height. They have a center point. They are simply used when we're drawing things out. So game object and game sprite, the other two interesting ones here. Um, so we go have a look at game object, also in our world folder. So this represents a, is a generic object within the game. 
and we're saying there that the game object knows which screen it belongs to. So this is how we link these things together. So a game object knows which game screen it belongs to. A game screen knows which game it belongs to. So we have all of these things linked. So any game object can say, give me my game screen. And any game screen can say, give me my game. And because we've got access back to the game, we have access to all of the different managers. That's how we share things um, across the architecture. Uh, there's an assumption here, and it is a fairly big assumption, that a game object will have a bitmap that can be displayed whenever we want to display the thing. Not necessarily, but for this simple setup, we assume that all game objects are drawable using a single bitmap. Um, need not be the case. You may have multiple bitmaps, you could have particle effects, you could have other things, but this is just the simplifying assumption that was made. We're saying that uh, all game objects have a position and it's using a vector2 class. And this is in the, the util directory inside here, vector2. Um, it's basically using a float x and a float y. And we want to have a floating point position. So we can have 12.7 as our location as opposed to sort of um, static integer values. So we have a, um, a position. We have a bounding box, which defines the surrounding for that. And again, that's declared in the utility one has a float x, a float y, um, a half width and a half height. So half the width, half the height again. It's easier for doing the collision detection test using half width and half height. And that is a box that encapsulates, it surrounds, it gives the size of that particular game object. And we'll use that if we want to do any form of collision detection or if we want to work out if that object is visible within the viewport. That's the bounds that we will be using to test for visibility for collision. Um, We've got a few uh, reusable recs. So if we're drawing this out, we're going to be drawing it to the screen space. And if you remember back to the demo for that, for the viewport one, we need to have two rec structures, rectangle structures. These are classes uh, built in one in Android. We do not want to be having to recreate these things every single time we go to draw it out. Uh, so we create two of them at the start, uh, source and our screen rect and we're going to store these so we will reuse them. So we create them up here for reasons of efficiency. Create a game object, um, pass in the game screen to which it belongs, or you can create one with a certain position and a bitmap, um, or, or there's different forms of constructors. We can get the bounding box out, uh, and there it will update the bound to contain the current position, and then return the bound out with that width and height. Uh, we can set the position, update, so all game objects can be updated. By default, it doesn't do anything unless in, when we override this, we say what type of update it should do. And if we're drawing it out, we'll look on drawing in a second. Um, there, effectively, it says we go to graphics helper, uh, which will be, uh, again, the util class over here. Get clipped source and screen rectangle. So it's an if. This, this will turn to true or uh, false. If it turns true, it's visible. If it returns false, it's not visible. If it does return true, then the source um, and screen rectangles will be updated to contain the relevant bits of the source bitmap or the screen that we should be drawing um, um, from and then to. And we go to our, our graphics objects. So this is the one that was passed in and we're calling one of the methods there for drawing the bitmap out. There's the bitmap, uh, there's the two rectangles and we're not using any form of, of sort of color tint or things like that. So it's just null on that particular version. Uh, here's a more slightly fancy version of the draw uh, where, okay, we will again be taking our time, uh, graphics object, the viewport, uh, the screen viewport, and this one we do pass in a paint instance. So we will draw it out with that type of paint effect being applied. So it's sort of different ways you can call this here depending on whether or not you want to use a paint. Um, so that, that's our game object. I mean, it's, it's, it's very simple. It's, it's something that has a position, has a size, has an image has a default input and has a couple of sort of standard ways of being displayed, simply drawing a bitmap to the screen with nothing fancy applied. Sprite then was a more refined type of game object. So this is one that built upon the game object and it had a, a it was assumed to be a moving object as opposed to one that just had a position and stayed there. Um, so in this one here, we have, I mean, you can have a look at it, but basically we've got an acceleration, we've got a velocity, we've got sort of caps applied in these things. Um, we have an orientation, which is the angle at which it's facing. Uh, we have an angular velocity, which is the speed at which it's rotating. 
and an angular acceleration, which is the speed at which the rotation itself is changing. Uh, so this thing, you, you can move around, it can rotate, all of those different things. Because we are supporting rotations, we need to have a matrix um, that we will use to draw the thing out, because matrices are good for drawing things out and rotated or scaled or things like that. Um, similar methods for creating it, mapping onto those within the game object. Um, update, so in this case, we do actually have a specific update. And it's going to update the acceleration, uh, change the velocity, change the position, uh, and likewise for the angular velocity, angular acceleration, and the orientation of it. So that simply moves the object depending on its acceleration, its speed, things like that. For drawing it out, we have to change the draw request because the previous game object just used the simple draw bitmap out. Here's a rectangle, here's a destination rectangle. This one we're using a matrix, um, so we have to draw out uh, the whole one. So we're calling uh, different for, for graphics helper, get source and screen rectangle. Um, doing a bit of, of scaling if need be on that particular one. And we're building up a matrix that we can uh, draw it out, scaled and rotate it and translate it to the right position. And then we draw that through our graphics interface onto the screen. So again, that's, that's simply how that one um, sets up. So we have our object, we've got our sprite as different refined types. Um, a specific game then would come in, it would say, right, well, I want to have a level one screen. I want to create my, you know, my collectible game object or my player sprite or, or whatever it's going to be um, by way of having something specific to the game. So other things we have within the architecture, um, the input manager. So we're going to have an input manager that lives within our game fragment. It will generate a number of um, either touch events or, or key events. So these are, are instances, events that have occurred that we are passing to our, our game to process. Alongside that, it's going to have an accelerometer, a compass handler, a key handler, or a touch handler. And, and there are things that we can sort of go to and ask, okay, what's the current accelerometer values? We can query those anytime that we want to. So we're having a look at these ones here. Uh, we're within our input folder. And inside this, we have a main input class. So this is the, the, the one that um, lives up in the, the game fragment. And the input class, it really is a container class itself. It contains handlers for the accelerometer, any key presses, any touches on the view, or, or the compass. So they're the ones that it, it supports by default. And you can have a look at this here. Basically, it just is um, um, something that you either set and get these different things. It is a few accessor methods. So it really is, is, is a bit of a wrapper that links these things together. So for example, for the, the touch stuff, so we have a touch event. Um, so this is what will be shared with the game. Uh, every single frame will get um, one or well, zero, one or more touch events, which correspond to any input that's happened since the last update. Um, for this here, we've got sort of touch down, up or drag. So it's, it's sort of simple forms of recognition. We've got a position and we've got a pointer ID telling us which touch point this is on the screen. Touch handler is where everything list, uh, happens. It's a touch listener. So it's attached to the view, uh, support a maximum of 10 touch points. And this, this is quite similar to the, the demo in terms of touch, in terms of being able to store each of those different touch points. Where it differs a tad is that we have um, two lists, uh, one for touch events, which are to be processed in the current update. And then a second list for new touch events, because th these touch events can come in all of the time. But basically, we want to accumulate them for one individual frame. So when we're updating a frame, we'll have a, a list of our touch events for that frame. When we go on to the next frame, we'll have uh, ones that we've accumulated since the last update, and that's what we'll pass into the next frame. Uh, because these are our objects, touch events, and because a lot of them will be occurring, we want to recycle and reuse. So again, it's under the util class, we have a, a pool class within that, which simply gives us a, a, a recyclable pool. We can create this, we can store unused objects within it, we can take objects out, and when we're finished, we can populate them, uh, put them back inside. 
Um, so beyond that, there, there's a little bit of scaling here, so you can you can sort of decide if you want to have sort of pixel points as your touch coordinates, or to have it from zero to one or minus one to positive one. There's different sort of ways of representing the relative location uh, of a touch point. Um, beyond that, sets it up. We 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 have the on touch, which is the main method. That uh, this is the callback method. Uh, so anytime we touch our screen, our view object, we'll get an emotion event. And inside this method here, we're processing that, working out what type of motion event has happened, um, updating um, our, our, our sort of touch event instance, the thing that we, we update, we create, and we're adding that into our unconsumed touch events. So as they come in, we, we store them until they're ready to be processed as part of a frames update. A uh, few methods for that, we can sort of call this directly to work out, do we have uh, you know, a, a particular touch ID? Or if we do, then what is that specific value at the current point in time? And so on. Um, get touch events is the one that we will most often call within our game. That if the player wants to work out well, what the user has done, uh, it's got a player object and uh, it, it wants to query, okay, what, is, what input the user has provided to our player object? We can go to our input manager and we can call the get touch events method and it's going to give us then a list of the touch events that the player object can actually update itself on. And the reset accumulators, this was the, the method that was called within uh, our game. So as part of the game, if you recall, uh, when we started doing our update, so at the beginning of an update, we reset all the accumulators. So that basically is the event, the, the event in here that says that, okay, whatever things I've accumulated, they then become current for this new update. And I'm going to then sort of clear out my accumulated uh, list for any new things that come in when I'm updating the game. Um, so that's probably all there is to say about uh, that one. The last one, arguably one of the more difficult ones, is the um, how we're drawing it out. Now, we're using a, a setup of having a single view to which we draw to. That's actually fairly simple. Uh, where there's a little bit of extra complexity in this is that this, this architecture has been designed so you can change the type of view that you're drawing to. Um, with different options, and we explored two of them within the demo. One was using a surface view, which was a bit slow because it was updated at the time of recording it by the CPU. Um, the second one we used was sort of a trick of invalidating um, the, the view object, which then got the GUI thread to update, and that was hardware accelerated, so it ran fast. If we're serious about Android game programming, we'll want to use OpenGL, a sort of proper um, hardware accelerated rendering um, structure to draw to it. So in terms of this, we're, we're trying to extract out how or what, what actual type of surface that we have. We don't care from a game object's point of view how the thing gets to be drawn. We just care that we can draw things. So we've got declared two interfaces. We've got one for the render surface. This could be a surface view, it could be an OpenGL surface, it could be some other type of view. And we've got our, our graphics 2D interface. And this contains our common set of methods for drawing out bitmaps uh, with certain rotations or things like that. And again, that could be implemented through a canvas object. It could be implemented through OpenGL calls. So again, we're abstracting these things out. Game objects don't need to worry about how they get to be drawn, just need to know that they can be drawn. Um, there's one implementation that's provided, which was the canvas render, which is the same one we used uh, within the demo. And then finally, over here, we've got a graphics helper, which is going to help us out with a number of the methods. So if we have a look at uh, these things here. So this is within our graphics folder. So inside this, we've got our two interfaces, render surface and graphics 2D. So the render surface uh, interface is very, very straightforward. Two methods. We've got um, one method called render. So I can go to our render surface and I can tell it I want you to draw this particular game screen. So I can say, here's a game screen. I want it to be drawn to this rendered surface. And I pass in the some time information if that's relevant to it. So when a render surface receives this, it's basically going to go to the game screen. 
and say to the game screen, look, I'm available. You can tell your game objects to draw to me. Here's my um, uh, graphics interface that you can use to draw to me. So we've got that link in. The second method we have is get as view. Because this is going to be added into our game fragment, our game fragment needs a view object, an Android view object. So whatever surface we have here, it has to be something that can be an Android view, else we can't add it to our fragment. Uh, so we need to have that ability as well. But you can see at this high level, we're saying very, very little. We're saying nothing about how it gets to be implemented. We're simply saying it needs to be a type of view and it needs to be something that can let a game, ob a game screen draw to itself. For the graphics 2D interface, um, so, so again, this, this, is, this is a small interface at the minute. You probably want it to be a bit more rich. Um, it contains the, the draw functionality that we're going to offer to a game object. So when we go to a game object and we ask it to draw itself, we're going to give it um, a graphics 2D uh, object. Um, it's going to use that there to draw itself out. So it, the, the graphics 2D will contain all of the relevant draw commands. So it's kind of like the canvas object we saw in the demos. Um, so a few things, you can get the width and the height of the canvas that we're drawing to. You can set up a clip region, you can clear it to specific color. You can draw some text, you can draw some bitmaps, um, either using rectangles or using a matrix. At the minute, that's, that's just the simple draw functionality we have. It doesn't really do much. With two specific implementations of this, uh, canvas render surface. So this is our view uh, and it implements the render surface. So we're, we're covering both things. It's an Android view, a type of Android view, but it's also a type of renderable surface. Uh, we're going to have our graphics object, which is a canvas graphics object. Uh, we're linked into the game, so this view knows it as part of the game fragment. Uh, also knows it's part of the activity, um, or the context of the activity. And um, where need be, we're going to sort of store the, the game that we will be drawing, and also storing the elapsed time. When we create the canvas renderer, so we're linking it into the activity and to the fragment, uh, we are simply building um, our, our new um, canvas uh, graphics. And, and so again, that, that's the next class I'll look at, and it too is linked into the activity. Um, for get his view, we are returning ourselves because we are a type of Android view, so that's all we need to return. And when we render things, how do we render them? Well, we store the information and we invalidate ourselves. So this, this was the old canvas trick that we used, that if the User, if the, um, the game thread comes to us and, and says, draw yourself, what we're going to do is we're going to invalidate ourselves, which will be a queue to the GUI thread that we need to be drawn. So whenever we post invalidate, the render method effectively is done, but the post invalidate will result in the on draw method being called by the GUI thread. And that's the one that will use hardware acceleration and it'll be drawn lovely and quickly. Um, so there we're doing a little bit of, of setup in terms of the two objects and um, we're going to the screen and we're basically asking the screen to draw itself out using the uh, graphics 2D associated with this one. Final thing, which was what we got way back at the start, was that whenever we um, do an update or a draw, we have to notify the game loop that it's finished. Uh, the responsibility for notifying that the draw has finished falls into the, uh, to basically the, the render surface. So whenever we finish doing our draw, we're going to notify the game that we have finished doing the draw, so then the game loop can carry on. Um, <clears throat> for the canvas uh, graphics 2D, which is a type of, of 2D interface, this simply is a wrapper around a canvas, nothing more than that. So it uses a canvas associated with the view. Um, and has methods then for drawing out the bitmap, um, again, drawing out text, or for clearing it. But in all cases, we're using underpinning canvas objects. So it's nothing more than a wrapper around the canvas. Doesn't really make a lot of sense in this case why we have that, but it would make more sense if we also wanted to support OpenGL. So if we were doing OpenGL recalls, for example, for drawing text or for clearing the screen, we would have to do it in a different way. We wouldn't be using a canvas for doing it in that case. Uh, the final one, which was our graphics helper, uh, inside this it, it contained um, a number of different methods that, uh, that sort of um, helped us out whenever we were drawing. So for example, you have this one here, uh, get clipped source and screen rectangle. 
where it was returning true or false depending on whether or not the thing was visible, if the game object was visible, if it was bounds within the layer viewport. We had a screen viewport and if it was visible we would be updating the values in our source, in our screen rectangle uh, so that they contained the relevant regions. And this is exactly the same from the viewport de uh, demo that we had a look at in terms of how we store those different values. Now that's, that's more or less it in terms of the, the functionality that we have uh, within our game. We've sort of covered these main classes. There's a few other ones in terms of AI and collision detection, but we'll look at those later on within the, the course. If you are thinking of using uh, the gauge architecture, it's worthwhile going through just getting a feel for how these things fit together, what role each of the different classes actually has. But it will take a bit of time because there are lots of different things that need to come together. If you're doing your own architecture, well and good. Um, you'll sort of be faced with much of the, the, the same sort of types of issues and problems that you had in this one. You can make whatever forms of simplifying assumption that you want to make so that you know, don't feel obliged or, or in any way necessary to go uh, and to put in sort of different types of renderable surface. If you have one that works for you, use that particular one. Um, beyond that, Happy exploring this particular class.